know, once we get it up and running, but they can. Being able to hear is part of the problem and kind of go over some of the things. You've already been using some of the Genesis stuff, right? So it's not like it's totally foreign to you, you've never seen it. Um, the biggest thing um, when you look at it, the power unit is the ability to run two tools at one time. And no, that's not new, I get it. People have been able to run two tools at one time for probably about the last 10 years. Um, one of the things that I want to make you aware of though with the Genesis product is what we call overdrive. And maybe some of you have played with it or haven't played with it yet, but give you an example when we're using a tool, a spreader, and a cutter, or a ram, or whatever you're using, the levers go out and the engage. Literally, there's two pumps in there. There's a pump in this block that's going this way, it's sending fluid out, and it's sending fluid out to that tool. With the Genesis tools, you have the ability to go into what we call overdrive. And overdrive is, is that we switch both levers the same way. Now, you can't run two tools, but you can run the other tool about a tenth of a second slower than twice as fast. Okay, so where we see departments really use this is, okay, you uh, got the door open and I don't know, it's a minivan and you decided, hey, the roof's gotta come off. Uh, you know, we got all these kids in the back and we're trying to figure out how we're gonna get them out. If I can make my cuts twice as fast and doing the roof removal or my cutting, if I'm making my relief cuts, we'll get into that today. We're doing a lot of cool stuff with uh, ramps and spreaders in conjunction to get some of the lifts. And with some of the cutters today with the cutting, spreads that you're going to be able to get our openings, I should say. Um, I kind of use this analogy. Uh, it's kind of like boxing. If I beat it up enough, right, and, and I joke that making all these relief cuts is kind of going to the body, going to the body, and then all of a sudden when it comes time for the uppercut, which is using the actual lift, it's going to go where I want it to go every single time. And I'll show you how to get that consistency. And the way it is is that it's using a lot of trimming and 4 by 4s relief cuts. And if you do those things and you do them consistently, you get good results all the time. Right? But my point of showing you this is, and we'll show it to you, we'll hook up a hose. If you want to run two tools, that's fine. Once you get the hoses hooked up to here, you have the one step coupler at the other end, you can start the power unit. And you shouldn't have to send anybody back to the power unit. So back to the days of up on red, down on red, up on blue, right? I think some of you lived in those days. Uh, tied up a guy, right? I mean, you basically had somebody at the pump, and that was pressure job. versus dump kind of thing. Yeah, dump the tool. So yeah, the and so the I want to switch a tool, and now you got oh crap, they're still using that one over there. Which one is it, right? And that was the whole idea between the red hose and the blue hose. It really was to be able to, and then Murphy showed up, right? Oh crap! You didn't tell me the red hose. I thought it was a blue hose, right? So then they did dump it, and we break, we pull a line off. Now fluids flying, right? <laughs> so one of the things that I want to go over is we get one of the extension hoses off the engine is to actually go over the coupler and making these switches. So once the hose is hooked up, we can start the power unit, our power unit started, we can engage it, and we can have the fluid coming, the fluid basically is to the end of the connection, and it's cycling around it. It's waiting for you to come along and hook up the tool. Okay? So a lot of times, just get that power unit down on the ground, get the hoses hooked up to it, get it started, and then, you know, there's a lot of other things that we have to do. Right, stabilization, might even be patient care, we got to get after that battery, all that. You change my several my speeds, it also changes the power of my cut. Yes, well, it doesn't change the 10,500 psi, that's what a lot of people think when we run two pump. We're not changing that. What we're doing is we're moving the fluid faster, we're moving the fluid a whole lot more efficient. Okay, what we found by going to this bigger motor. Like the simul pump that you have on there that's been on there, the looking glass guy in the back, when they got that stuff new, that pump moves the fluid a whole lot faster than a lot of That'll work. That'll work fine. Bring that over. That's fine. We'll be all right. Um, when, we, when we go to the speed thing, is, is that we just get the work done faster. The cutter opens and closes faster. All right. So, you know, where, where do you see it show up? I'll give you an example of a bit of Roscom in the last five years, um, either Smarter or Looking Glass 1 up there, okay? And everybody, this is the most common thing I heard was, how do they do it so fast? Well, when the tools open and close faster, it relates to you do the extrication faster. Also, one of the things, the stuff that I'm going to show you today, because they get in there and they get aggressive and they cut and cut as far as relief cuts, that's that taking time to make time that when they actually go to do the maneuvers that they're trying to execute, they happen quickly for them, and they don't fight it. You ever have that uh, dash raise or that uh, 
ramp push where you're fighting it, where it just doesn't, for whatever reason, it doesn't want to go where I want it to go. And it doesn't help that the uh, side of the car got driven in, and I'm trying to make something work here going back to a B, B post. Um, that's where these B heads are going to come in. And we'll get into that a lot in technique stuff. All right? So six of you, I understand, are kind of, we're going, we're doing a train the trainer with the idea that we're going to bring you guys up to speed so, with the idea that then they come back and they share all this stuff with you guys. Um, how, does it, how does it work? And it's, it's kind of proven what, what we're going to show you today. Um, in Grand Rapids, a guy by the name of Dave Norman and uh, actually Bruce Veldkamp, they're kind of the extrication guys. And the same stuff that I'm going to show you here today is the same stuff that they're using. We actually ran the whole department through it. And it was kind of interesting. This was uh, somebody actually looking at it from the outside, a deputy chief who actually went inside and he came back and was at an extrication with man of our skills got better. Well, the truth of the matter is it's the repetition thing coupled with their, again, how we get the skill stuff implemented and do it. And it is. You see it. We, I believe we get people out of cars a whole lot faster today, or have the ability to get them out of cars faster than we ever have, with a lot of little stuff that we link those things together. All right? So what I want to show you in the coupling, it, it's gonna, if we're going to hook up this hose to here, this, and you're charging. Once you bring this out and it's running, you'll feel it. There's fluid moving around in here. Okay? You, you can tell when it's tough. Okay? To couple this hose together, it's just nothing more than you take this male lock, this female swivels, and you put it on and you lock it. Now I tell people, everybody says, well, it's a turn and it's a little more. When you put the big fire gloves on because it fills up your hand a little more, uh, a lot some people with gloves or not big hands will actually say, well, it feels like I gotta go a little bit beyond. But it, you'll feel it locks in. Also notice that the swivels. Um, you ever get where the hoses get tangled? And now it's, uh, I used to call it the extrication, uh, your rodeo, okay, you hold up the spreader while I tuck the cutter underneath. <laughs> if this gets tangled up to the point where you don't like what's going on, release it, Un unwind that, and then bring it back over here and hook it together. We'll do some of that today because, you know, some of the stuff will pop in and we'll say, okay, the stuff's tangled now, how do we work around that? Um, the new stuff also that will be coming when you get down the road with the hoses, you'll see Odeker clamps. I actually have a hose in the van that I'll show you today, but we're going to get rid of the zip ties. We weren't able to get rid of the zip ties on these reels because we weren't able to reset the couplings on this. We tried to do that, but the hoses uh, changed. But down the road, you'll see that. So I think that'll be one of the changes that you'll see that makes it a whole lot easier. On the Genesis tools, the control valve, and this is totally different than what you're used to. You're used to more of a twist, right, or the thumb push, is that it's either up or down. And it can be ran from here. It can be ran from here. Okay. And it also gives you the ability to feather. So one of the things we'll be working on today when we get out there is how do I feather? Why would feathering be important? Close conjunction with a patient being there. Yeah. You don't want to go okay. Too much. For every action, there is a reaction, right? And with the reaction, I say a lot of people say it's either equal, right? Or how about this? For every action, there's a reaction. That reaction can be good, and that reaction can be bad. You know? All right. Um, give you an example of that. Um, it was shared with me a department that maybe might be in West Michigan area. They uh, had a van overturned, and they're trying to bring this lady out, this previous size lady. And somebody got the idea, well, if we increase the opening of the windshield by pushing the roof away, which in theory was a good thing. However, when they went in there, because the spreader only had so much spread, they decided to incorporate 4x4s into there. Have you ever played Tiddlywinks? <laughs> the 4x4 actually come out of the equation and hit the patient in the head. We have a lady who's talking to us at the time that the extrication is going on. This is what was shared with me. I wasn't present for it, but it was shared with me to the point where she actually gets hit by a 4x4. What's the reaction, right? What's it going to do? So what is the control thing with the cutting, I believe, too, and even the spreading is, if I can slow that spreader down by how much I let go through this valve, I'm going to get more, more uh, control over the situation. All right? Same thing when we cut something off. If I was to cut this bar right now, not such a big deal. It's attached on both sides, right? You see that a lot of times we cut A post, B post, C post. What happens when, if I was to take this part off and cut it here and then go to cut this? I would expect that to fly, right? So I want to come in and I want to slowly cut that with the idea that I don't want it to become a projectile. If I want to come in and just nail it, I can make it fly. I mean, we can go out and 
jump here this afternoon and make doors fly. But I don't think anybody else want to work on that scene when the doors are flying and we're trying to provide picture here and everything else, right? So that's one other thing. If you, if you come on around here for you guys that are over here ways, but let's look at this control valve for a while. For a minute, I should say. There's a flat side of it, okay? And I call it the notch side of it. The notch side is where the work occurs. So to give you an example, if you want a spreader to spread, it's the half moon side. If you want a cutter to close or cut, I mean, that's what it's primarily designed to do, right? It's the half moon side. So what do you think if I want to make this ram extend? It's the half moon side. So one of the things that we hear people say, you know, I think we've all been there, it's at night and you're in there in close confines and it's hard to see and you're trying to maybe unwind somebody's feet and you're going, man, I hope when I turn this handle the right way that that cutter or tool goes away. Let's be honest, we've got there, right? Where the idea here is say, wait a minute, what I gotta remember is I gotta remember on the half moon side is gonna do what I want it to do, okay? So that that's kind of a, a big thing to you know, trigger shape. used to. What's that? It's trigger shape. Yes. Also this, what is this? We talk about motor skills. This is a fine motor skill, right? This is a gross motor skill. This is muscles going all the way up my arm that cause it to go here. And if you've noticed in the past, a lot of that stuff, you actually physically had to bring it back in order to make it go the other way too, right? This valve, and, and all of them now, everything out there today is going to what they call a dead man valve. If you let go of it, it stops. However, being able to slide in and say, okay, well, my hand's gonna be up against the work now, that's not good. If I can come to the outside, and now I can finish what I'm doing, or I can back it off and reset it. Okay? Um, all the tools, I should say all the cutting tools and the combi tools, because the combi cuts and spreads, have a handle that rotates 360 degrees. We'll go over that out in the junkyard. Probably the biggest thing that I see is that a lot of people, you know, they go in there with that cutter and they get in there, and then it starts to spin and they fight with it, right? What I like Sarah may do is, is to be more in an athletic stance. When the thing starts to move, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to widen my hips and I'm going to hang on to it. All right? And I like to have my hands on the control valve and on the handle because I can't cut my hands off or get them pinched if they're on, right? But in the process, when I come in there, as the thing starts to move, let that handle rotate around instead of fighting. It. Actually move yourself off the tool set, okay? So that you get, um, you're keeping your back in a, in a straighter position. Let's face it, nobody stays in this business very long once you jack your back. We agree on it? I think we all know somebody who's messed up their back, and whether it's lifting patients or how we take stuff or use tools, okay? Um, can we grab the cutter and the spreader off of there? There again, we'll get it all out here on the table. And how about an extension hose too? That way I can hook it to this pump and we'll get it running. You guys can... When you pick up the, the cutters, and, and I've got one of the great big cutters in the van. I'll, I'll get it out today to show you and stuff when we talk about high strength steel. High strength steel takes somewhere between 180 to 220,000 pounds of cutting force in order to cut it, okay? That isn't a number that, I'm, that I came up with. It's not a number that, if you want to say, all the extrication um, companies came up with. That's in white papers. It's documented. People have done the research, okay? And so what do we need to do is we need to have the ability to cut it. But one of the things you have to look at, especially when you get into the higher strength steel, and I'm hoping that we run into it with some of the new stuff that we're going to get a chance to cut on today, is it used to be that when you pulled up there again for the cutter to close, it would just cut it. We agree on that? And if it didn't, what happened? Stop. Yeah, you'd reposition it or you'd say, hey, you know, I got to do this, or I got to do that. Or, hey, maybe the workaround was a sawzall, right? We'd say, get the sawzall, okay? The problem with the high strength steel is, is that the sawzall doesn't hold up real well to the high strength steel, the blade. But also further, there are special blades, but even having the big sawzalls in order to run them in the blades, most people <laughs> don't have them, all right? When you come up to cut something, so I come in here to cut this high strength steel, and I pull up on that button, you got to be thinking this is that it's like 100,000 pounds, 110, 120, 130, 140, 150. See where I'm going with that? It's not just bam, you nail the trigger, it's 200,000 PSI. A lot of people, you know, start counting and it's like they're up to about 10 and it's been like 10 seconds in their head and they go, this ain't working. Well, when they do that, what just happened? Back down the stairs. We start over again. <laughs> okay? In the past, when a cutter only came up to 90,000 pounds of cutting force or it come up to 60,000, it got there very fast. 
but when we're going above again it. Also something that you're, you're gonna you're see in here today is usually when we cut something, you ever notice it kind of sounds like a beer can being crushed? I mean, there's a very crunchy, smashing, you know, that, that sound. With a high strength steel, there's a very distinct snap or pop. I equate it to almost like uh, you're snapping a stick over your thigh out in the woods. If you were to pick up a stick and you want to break it and you snap it over your thigh, it has a very distinct snap. The thing is, though, is that a lot of this high strength steel, where they get the strength in the B post for the crash ratings, is it's layering. So don't get be surprised. I'll give you an example. Um, I've had the opportunity to cut up three Chevy bolts. When you're cutting on the bolt, especially on the B post, because they layered the high strength steel, is there's a very distinct snap, snap, and then a pop. Okay? And some would say, well, I heard the snap, we must be through. You want to hear the pop, which there again is like that stick breaking, but also you'll see it separate. Everybody good on that? You'll actually see that, that stuff's under compression. And truth be known, we're really not cutting steel anymore in the high strength steel. We're almost, we're, we're getting it to fatigue so that it breaks, and I think that's why we're hearing that snap. All right, that's coming right from, you know, the folks at General Motors and stuff with the Volt and some of those cars. Are you going to see the high strength steel in the new cars? Yeah, you're going to see it in everything. Why? Because they're getting incredible crash ratings with these cars. Okay? So, you know, the spreading of the door probably hasn't changed a whole lot. You're going to be able to use your spreader for the most part. You're rolling it off the latch. The doors are pretty beefy outside of the outside skin. We're going to talk about that today, staying away from the skin. Nothing good happens on the outside and all the good stuff happens deep inside. Okay. Notice all the cutters are balanced. If I grab that big cutter, that's one of the things with Genesis ergonomics. Straight up, guys, when I first met a guy out of Ohio who showed up at a fire station in Grand Rapids, he says, hey, if you look at my stuff, I said, yeah, come back at 1 o'clock, I'll look at your stuff. I picked the thing out of the rack, I went, damn, somebody was thinking, it's balanced. <laughs> no, I'm not fighting to, to hold this here. Well, if I can get something balanced, so I'm not doing this, right, that wouldn't be a bad thing. The other thing that got my eye was this. The handle rotates 360 degrees. If I got to come in here, I'd move the cutter. I'm also not now, you ever been on that job where you're doing one of these? <laughs> okay. What, what's the stance I want you in? I want you in this stance right here. I want you in a nice, wide, athletic stance. And when the cutter starts to twist, I let it twist. I don't fight it. You can't fight 10,500 PSI. No, nobody in here is going to fight this. Okay. Just enjoy the rest. Also, when I come in to cut stuff, a lot of times you're going to notice the tools are getting longer. So we'll say this is the side of the car. Sometimes people come in to cut like a B-post here, and guess what? When the blade catches, what, what does the tool do? It runs up along the side of the car. Well, it's not good to run this all into the side of the car. The car has a lot of strength, and you're side-loading all of this. So what's the fix? Start right here. If you start center, to just about everything you're going to cut, yeah, it's going to twist one way or the other. But it's not going to run up against. Same thing with this. If I'm making a cut here and I run it down into the ground, I've had departments do this and rip the hoses right out of the back of the unit. <laughs> what was the fix? They needed to start higher. So we'll work on that today. If the tools are coming in contact with the side of the car, stop. What's the fix? Move it around a little bit more. Okay? Also, on the cutters. The blade that catches first is the way the cutter is going to go. Now, you remember when we used to come in to do a dash raise, we'd make one cut low, okay? And then we'd put that ram in there and we'd try to and push. And this is before they started changing some things around in the, in the construction of the cars, okay? We would make that one cut and we'd come in there. You ever notice that cutter always went in on the patient? You been at that call? It's like you're, you're working in there and it's like, Crap, the cutter the keeps going in, or the cutter's up against the seat or the patient. If I can get the blade on the other side to catch, I can get that cutter to go the other way. Sometimes, and that's one nice thing about these blades, they have a little more of a pinch. Sometimes I'll come in and I'll actually put a little dent in there to give, give it a weak spot so that blade can catch so it will come in. We're going to work a lot on that today. Also, I'm a big advocate to, I call it push and steal. I want to get those fenders out of the way. The reason I want to get those fenders out of the way is I want to be able to get into the back and usually in that wheel well, there's a fin there and if I can get that blade to catch on that fin, guess which way the cutter goes? Because it catches there, it doesn't go towards the patient and then I'll come from the wheel side all the way around. Okay. So we'll talk about you know, 
coming in today. We'll talk about taking that fender. Um, you know, it's a lot of stuff that's been out there and a lot of different videos and different things, and, and we're going to put it all together and kind of play with it. Um, the other thing that we're going to do today is, you ever notice that sometimes we go to a car accident and we blow all the glass out? So we cut the windshield out, we, we take out total glass removal, which was what I was taught. Uh, you know, Fred Beck probably is up there somewhere, and he was quite a rescue guy over in the Detroit area in the early 80s, and he's like, you got to take out all that glass. Well, my question to this is, what are we doing to the shocky patient when we pound out all the glass and it's 20 degrees? Yeah, potentially body temperature is dropping right along. Now, you guys are in a unique position. You have the ALS capability. We can start some IVs. We can do some different things. Well, a couple of years ago, I ran into some people up north, up in the Big Rapids area, and these guys said, hey, can we show you something? I said, yeah, what do you, what do you want to show me? And they said, we don't take out any glass other than the glass that we're going to work at. Really? So if you're going to just pop this front door, the only glass you're going to remove is that front door? Yep. I said, yeah, but you know, the whole idea of taking out glass is so when we move the metal around, it doesn't break and fly and everything, right? Well, I'm going to base it on about 400 cars now. They're right. If you take the glass as you go and we'll play with that, I've actually pushed the dash and tweaked it and left all the glass in on the other side. And very rarely today will I even mess with the windshield. I can push the dash through the windshield, but it's laminated. It's not going anywhere, right? And I'm limiting, you ever have that dust that's coming down through? You know, after you saw it out, there's all that dust blowing around. I've got to believe that's not good for somebody's wounds either, right? So we're, some of the stuff that I want to show you today, you, know, you guys have to decide what works for the Delta Fire Department, okay? Um, I just want to show you some technique. I want to show you some things that we're doing and some things that you're able to do with the current tools that you have so that we can uh, get the job done quicker. Now, this cutter right here, this is a... Uh, C-130 cutter. Ten years ago, this was the biggest cutter on the market. In fact, when this cutter cut, it had 90,000 pounds of cutting force of the nut, that was a big deal. Nobody could touch it. Today, 90,000 isn't even going to get us anywhere close to what we need to do with the high strength steels, okay? So I just want you to be aware of that. Now, I have on the, on the truck, and I, and I believe on the looking glass here, there's a 165 cutter, which is 144,000 pounds. That cutter, a lot of people that when they go to the bigger cutter will keep that cutter and they'll still use it day to day. They cut in a lot of places, and then when they come up against the high strength steel, when they want to make a cut, they'll pull off and go to the bigger cutter. So the idea here, the reason is, is this is 34 pounds. The big cutter, the 236 cutter, is 44 pounds. So you're adding 10 pounds to the cutter. What you're finding today is the cutters that are with the high strength steel weigh about the same as what the spreaders do. This is a smaller spreader. It's only a 24 inch spreader. This weighs about 35 pounds, okay? These are nice for door pop and getting things going and stuff, but when you get up against some of the bigger stuff, um, you're gonna have to move up into the bigger coverage of the spreaders. But there again, let's work smarter, right? Let's use the lighter weight stuff, let's save our backs, and then when we need to. Because the, the ability to hot swap is a beautiful thing, right? That I can come in here and I can swap these out. Are there any questions on kind of what, I'm kind of giving you an idea where we're going today. Hopefully I'm setting the stage for some of the stuff that we're going to work on. What I would like to do is I'd like to put that pump down on the ground and I would like to fire it up. I would like all of you to switch with a connector so you get an idea with that. And uh, also open and close to control valve. I find if we do that on the front end right now, then everybody by the time we get out there, we're not screaming over the top of the power unit trying to work in the jump bed. All right. Um, real fast on the pump, for you guys who are doing rig checks, this reservoir here, right on the side here, if it's in the glass, we're good. Um, this has got a little bit of a lean to it. You know, it's a little higher. We set this out where it's a little more level. It should be about the middle of the sight glass. If I've got oil in the sight glass, even if it's down to maybe about a third, I probably wouldn't mess with it. Okay? What you don't want to do is fill this up. You do not want to fill that sight glass full of oil because hydraulics are dependent on you giving a little bit of an airspace. Um, I went to a department recently to do service and the guy says, yeah, our tools are really slow. Well, they packed, I mean, not only you could have got any more hydraulic fluid in there, and it just <laughs> caused things to slow things down. If you do have to add fluid, it's right here. You take this cap off right here, I would recommend using a funnel. What are you using as a site? There again, get it on a level, level ground or a level surface. And you're just adding into the oil that comes up to the middle of here. Ideally, I like to have it right in the middle. But it's just a matter of spinning this cap out, and that's where the fluid goes in. Very good on that? Oil, it's a, it's a Honda mineral. Yes, oil. yes, it's mineral oil. 
Um, you've got with the, uh, the owner's manual that I delivered here last week, the MSDS sheets here. Um, this is the big things that I gleaned out of the MSDS sheet was if you get it in your eyes, you want to rinse your eyes out with copious amounts of water. If it's still bothering you after you do that, you're going to want to seek, seek attention. And let's face it, today in occupational health, and once we get hurt, we got, I know I might have heard, you got to go to the clinic. It isn't if you're going to go, you're going. So with that idea, just let them know what you have going on. Um, safety glasses go a long ways in present, preventing that type of stuff too, right? Um, if you get it in your mouth, you're going to go better tomorrow. Okay? You're going to lubricate your system a little bit. What I'm getting at, I wouldn't be drinking a whole bunch of mineral oil, but if you were to get some in your mouth, it's not going to be. It's not like it's uh, some of the old phosphate ester and some of the older stuff that heck, you didn't want to get that stuff on your clothing because it was you know, hard on your turnout gear. All right? The engine oil is right here. Typical Honda engine, I think a lot of us have had of it on uh, you know, power washers and different home equipment. If the, this unit does not start on the first pull, I'll say that again, if it does not start on the first pull, that's the first place I'm going to. Honda Motors are notorious for starting on the first or second pull. All right? so I also like to leave them in the on position. So after I shut them off, I like to go to on so it comes off the truck ready to go. But on position here, I always go right to full choke. Okay. You're going to dump the fuel. It's your SOG that the fuel is off. Correct. And Honda recommends that your fuel is up. What happens if you leave the fuel on is that fuel starts to get ends up in your oil. And the problem is, is that it thins out the oil. And the sensor in there believes that it doesn't have oil, even though you'll open the reservoir. And it'll be so full choke, switch is on, fuel is on. The throttle is right here. I like to go to, if you start on low throttle, you can, it's fine. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Bring the choke over to where it's running smooth. Okay? I'll say it again with these kind of motors. Bring it over to where it runs smooth. Very few of these can you just turn the choke to off right now in the little run. That's a Honda thing. Okay. And I've had departments tell me, okay, well, is it a half on? Is it a quarter on? I've seen departments either go so far as they'll take uh, somebody got somebody's nail polish, they get a little mark. Is that what it ran the best? The problem is, is the thing aged or as time went on, the line started moving. There again, it's running very smooth. Do you agree on that? Yeah, yeah. It's got some choke on it. If you drop it off, this one's running pretty nice. Some of them, though, are always going to run with a little choke on it. Does that make sense? Okay. Then throttle it up. Gas is off. Okay, gas is off. And the choke, choke is, is off. Up. When I go to make sure it's on, yep. dump the fuel, full choke. Okay. Hey, Kevin. Yeah. My question. In regards to when we terminate the incident, do we run the fuel out to a drive? You know what I mean? Like, I think there was a question that came up the other day, yeah. and we were told that go ahead and then run the fuel, shut it off, shut the fuel off, run it until it. If you're talking with some people, there's kind of two schools of thought. Some run it out, some don't. I like to run it out. Yeah, it's usually, especially yep. with the ethanol, yep. it will absorb the water in there. Yep. But if, if things get run every week like it's supposed to, you, know, you shouldn't have to. But since Just a good idea. You know, it's going to come down to with you guys, you know, what's your policy going to be? Are you going to run it, you know, run it all the way out? <laughs> uh, you know, I. My demo units and stuff, but I'm out probably once a week using them. You know, I, I leave I leave it in the bowl, but I do I, I am big on making sure the fuel's shut off. I don't think it's a bad thing to necessarily run out. So all you're doing is when you run this when you bring this to on, it's like a gravity feed. You're just letting more gas dump out of here into the bowl. So it's not like it's not going to get gas right away. You know what I mean? So if you did run it all the way out. But bring up a valid point. You know, the ethanol and stuff that's in here today. You know, we, we know with small engines, we're starting to see that there is, you know, the fuel seems to have an effect. And the big thing he's right is running it, but I'd also go further, it's not just starting it, okay, it starts. I would hook up a hose, even if you just hook up one, run the tool in and out a couple of different times. You know, the more you want to exercise the system, so to speak, so that you're, uh, you know, 
and also at a period of time, I want to turn the fuel over on a somewhat regular basis, right? You know, I've been to places where, you know, it's the same fuel in from a year ago, and fuel breaks down pretty fast these days, too. Okay? So, to answer your question, walking up, on, full choke, pull down. Say my engine for some weird thing that happens and I lose my engine. Can I operate the tool by just making my own compression by pulling? Yes. It will. It will move. Yep. How do I? And I, and I can confirm it because uh, I had a had a department that uh, basically didn't turn on the on switch and they kept pulling and pulling. And then the tool was moving. And one of the guys said, "Hey, the tool's moving." Well, here's the deal. For the tool to move, what has to be here? Engaged, right? Yeah. And they had a smaller motor on it, and it's kind of like trying to start your car in gear. How does that work? <laughs> so the fix was is that they had to, they just went back to neutral, and they pulled it and started <laughs> by hitting the on switch. That's why I say it right out of the box right now. If it doesn't start on the first pull, I would go right to the on and off switch. That's the place to start. And I would go to full choke. That's probably the two things that are in place if you do that. I know it seems like pretty simple stuff, but also I think, you know, there again, Murphy's showing up and it's the heat of the moment and it's a you know, traumatic scene and we're caught up in a lot of other things and little things like that get overlooked. Come back to the basics and just keep, keep working at it. So let's do this. Let's, let's fire this up and let's put this thing in gear right now just to show you that it's out on the floor, right? It's a, it's a circle system, so it doesn't matter which connection there is. No, it does not. We're gonna, in fact, we're going to have nothing hooked up on this side, and we're going to run it over here. Okay? So why don't one of you guys start it?
PSA only, Why I would you? only Can you say it again? cut in overdrive. Only. Only. Everybody good on that? Sure. Why? Why would I why would I say that? More power. More pressure. It's too fast. You want to be spreading that fast? See where I'm okay, going with that? Yeah. You're okay. spreading a door oh, off and somebody comes okay. in there. Watch this. Wham! Boom! Boom! <laughs> Remember, I want to be able—I want to be able to feather this. And remember, when I'm making cuts, I want to cut the roof off of that car. I want to quickly do it, right? So I've stripped out the plastic. I know where it's at, and I'm making my cut. Let's walk over by this car for a second. We can cut it. That's right. Going to, and we decide we're going to take the roofs off. You know, it used to be—it really didn't matter where you cut. You know what I mean? You just went out there and you said, "Hey, we're taking the roof off." Although Fred Beck, way back from my. Uh, Rescue class at Macomb Community College said, "No, you always cut it below. Why did he tell me to cut it below? Most so of the way, the car to work or whatever, yeah. it wasn't in the way, more right? Way. Here's the thing, though. You notice that there's a lot more metal here than here. I don't care whether you're using hydraulic rescue tools, you're using a sawzall, you're using a K12, you're using a plasma cutting torch, you're using anything that can cut." A sawzall, less is always going to be faster than more. All right. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, if you have a choice, the pickup trucks about the same. I would cut it low. Why? I want to get rid of this stuff. I want it out of my way. And I don't want to have to work over it. However, if you look at some of these cars, even you look out there on that Chevy Impala out there, the black one, very wide at the bottom, very narrow at the top. Less is faster. I'm going to make that cut high there because mm -hmm. I, it's going to just be faster. All right. So there is some, you know, when you start looking at speed, and speed is just that we're getting our patient out of the car faster, right? I'm not compromising patient care. I'm not corking screwing anybody out. I'm taking. I'm big on, huge on stabilization. That car should never move. I treat everybody that they have a C-spine injury. I want them to go home in halos, not wheelchairs, right? I right now, or and I make it personal. So. When we start looking at some of those, if you look at the white car out there, the Grand Prix though, it's all about the same. I'm going to cut low just because it's out of the way. Everybody good on that? Mm -hmm. When we go to cut, we have to pop the plastic up. It's not if it's going to have airbags, it's how many today. All right? And it's also common that all the airbags aren't going to fire. So if this thing you know, piles into the telephone pole head on or into a tree, you're going to have the frontal up, but you may not have the side up. Remember a lot of the side curtain stuff is coming down out of the sides here. It's coming down at about 165 miles an hour. Okay, and I don't, nobody in here is faster than that. Otherwise you'd be playing something with a ball or a puck on set Sundays, right? And what I'm getting at is, is that we want to make sure that we protect ourselves when we're in and around those areas. Also something that you're going to see, and hopefully we'll run into it, hopefully some of that stuff's in there, we'll see, because I know we're dealing with you know parts of cars. Um, a lot of the stuff that fires the side curtain stuff fires out of the seat post. And it very rarely takes up the whole length. So I might have a window of opportunity here, and I might have a window of opportunity here, but I can't cut here. And I'll show you today even using markers. I'll write right on there. Once I identify where it's at, I'll put no cut and draw a line. For you officers that are out there, I think this is a big thing to do when you're going around. The initial actions, they're doing patient care, they're doing different things. The plastic's being pop. When they tell you something, let's say it's in this area where the flag's at, I want to draw a line across here and I want to put no cut in that area. Because many times, if you notice, when it comes time to roof removal and stuff, it's late in the game or maybe things aren't going quite so well, right? We thought that we were going to be able to do this and plan A didn't quite work, so now we're on a plan B and that didn't quite work. And hey, this will give us a little more room, so let's, let's go there, okay? The idea is to mark it early, okay? Also, they'll tell you the auto engineer folks that when they put the high strength steel, especially in the B post, it's not all the same steel, okay? They know that there's certain areas, like right in through here, where they want to protect your torso. It's usually a little bit less at the very bottom or at the very top. The only problem is, is pretensioners and stuff down low, now in the seat belts, because not only do we have airbags, we have pretensioners that have, we don't want to be cutting into that. And also I ran into the BW Jetta now, the new ones, Side curtain actually fired. So that was a workaround that a lot of people looked at. Well, if I can't get this, sometimes the workaround is to cut here because the roof is going to be a little weaker, and then I'll and then I'll get it to come out. The problem is, is that now they're starting to make, uh, 
the uh, actuator for the big glare bags above the beep post. That bag and the jet actually goes that way now. Okay. So you gotta, my point here is, you gotta look. You gotta rip it off, okay, strip it before you rip into it with cutting. Right? The days of, hey, grab the cutter and take the roof off. Slow down for a second. Otherwise, someone's going to get hurt. Okay? Right. Um, thing on batteries before we go, and we'll see today as we go through. You guys can let me know down the road, especially you guys are going to be the trainers. Ron Moore from Firehouse Magazine. you probably seen some of his articles. Ron Moore has a book out by Mosby, so one of the medical books, right? Some of the medical books, Mosby books. Mosby book, he says that 80% of the batteries in cars today are under the hood and they're on the driver's side. <laughs> so since I read that, I've been keeping score. I've been marking it down, keeping a little journal, and guess what? He's right. You know, I get guys saying, oh no, it's on the passenger side. So one of the things that I kind of, well, we have to play with a little bit is, we're starting to go with, maybe in the scenario you say, hey, you can't get at the latch, and you can't get at the latch because you have a big patient. How do I get under the hood? And what I'll show you today is we're laying the spreader right on the windshield and actually lifting up on this and pulling up on that and then cutting it with the hydraulic cutters and then moving the spreader down here and actually opening the spreader up. Remember, all the other initial actions are going on. We've done our size up, we're doing stabilization, we might even be stripping plastic, we might even be putting somebody in the back seat to hold C-spine. But now we want to go after that battery before we really start cutting into there. Some would say, yeah, but it's going to crack that windshield a little bit when you push off of it and lay that tool on it. You're getting ready to cut their car up. Hmm. I think if they don't total the single buy them and with that, they're again working smarter by letting the car hold up the tool, right? And so when I come in here, and I'll, I'll show you that today. And one of the things I like is when you pry that up and then you come in with a cutter, that way we know the tools are good and ready to go. We know they work, right? And we know it's in gear. We know the motor's running. We know we're ready to go. And as we make that cut, sometimes I can lift with the spreader right there. I'll shine a light in it and if I see the battery, Sometimes right there I can lift it just enough that somebody can reach in there and cut the cables. Which cable are we cutting first? Negative. The negative. What if there's three negative wires? Three of them. Cut all, all three. All right. I'm also a big advocate for chunking it out. Mm -hmm. Not just cut it, move over. And I don't care if you move over an inch or you move over a foot. But take a chunk out. Now, something that our guys kind of came up with, I thought it was kind of funny that at the time somebody says, what the heck did you teach them? The guys were... were you know, we wanted to make sure they were doing it, we weren't sure they were doing it. So what we asked them to do was, is they give us the chunks. So that got to be a joke. So let me get this right, Cap. You want me to give you the chunks, but let me ask you this. If you were running that scene, if you were the incident commander, would it be a bad thing to know that that was taken care of? Yeah. And once he sees that, that's one more thing he can check off, right? So what the guys got to be a joke is they were throwing them at it. They were here. So they little, and at first, some of the BCs and they're going, what in the heck are you teaching these guys? What, what this is this, are you crazy? But now I said, well, think about this. Is it done? Do you know it's done? Because how many times do you walk around the other side and you aren't sure? You told somebody to do that and you hope that it, maybe they haven't gotten to it. Right? So when we take the battery, here's the other thing. 90% of the batteries in cars today, I'll say it again, 90% of the batteries in cars today are under the hood. Are we good on that? Yes. So where do I start? Good. Anybody want 90% odds? We're going to the casino today. You take 90%? Yeah. No. So 80% driver, driver's side, the other 10 over there. Hey, so you pop the hood up and it's not there. Well, then it could be anywhere, right? Could be in the trunk, could be under the seat, could be in the fender well. Even the ones, the Chryslers that are in the fender well, they're on the driver's side. That lends to the 80% are on the driver's side. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Even hybrids, even true electric cars, will always have a 12-volt system. Why? If you want radios, air conditioner, kind of the comforts in the cab of a car, you got to have a 12-volt system. Okay? You still got to go after it, you still got to get it. Okay? The other thing with uh, four ways, yep. a lot of newer vehicles, airbags go off four man four is automatically gone, but it's going to it just hit the four ways so you always know Another, another good thing to do if you can, while you're talking, reaching in to get the four ways, power the windows down. If, if, if I'm going to work on this side, I'm going to hit the button and power these windows down. Now I don't even have to break them, right? I put them in the doors. Okay. Also, 
some of the things they advocated is moving the seat back there again. Depending on my patient's on whether I can maintain control of the patient, right? <coughs> but that buys me a little room. But what he's saying is, is put the four ways on with the idea that when the battery's cut, you shouldn't see a still dead. So another way of confirming that we got that done. So we cut the negatives, and then we cut the positive, right? I, I want you to cut both sides of the battery. So let me ask you this. Could this also be a bonus move that if we lift this up and we clip this, when we get ready to make our cut Relief. to our dash raise, Relief. the hood's already out of the way, isn't it? And I already have access. And if the battery's not here, guess where the guy with the spreader's going? Right back around to the other side. Mm -hmm. And we're going to lift up the other side. If it ends up being on the other side, well, that's good. Now we've cut both sides here. And now I have the ability to flip the hood up almost like a Corvette, which allows me access, especially when I make my really cuts. Anybody have any questions on what we've covered so far? I'd like to do a lot of this stuff. I think we can talk a whole lot better. I think it's a whole lot more controlled. We have, you know, the sweat's not rolling down our forehead. And, it's like for the cylinder, press cylinder. Um, does the hose or anything else give me a problem? For the airbags? Yep. No. Now, what you're going to see coming out of the cylinder is typically you're going to have your cylinder, usually they're no longer than that, and they're about that big around, about the size of a, like a brat or something like that, all right? There were, a lot of times there's a metal tube that comes out of it that they actually slide the airbag over, there's like a clamp on it, okay? If you cut above the cylinder and you cut through that tube, actually, you've actually, if it does fire, it's not going to fill the airbag. Someone did it the other day. And it happened, they didn't cut the cylinder, but they cut something like maybe that's what they did. And it scared the living guitar of the uh, Kunkers you know I mean? Here? No, no. Oh, not here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing that you'll see is some of the stuff when you go on the website, it'll say that this has a side curtain airbag and it fires from here. And they say this whole area is a no cut area. And that's caused the rescue industry to step back and say, wait a minute, the thing fires from here. Why is this a no cutter? I mean, here it's a bunch of material rolled up, tucked up in that headliner. And what they came back with, no, you can cut it here. And also think about this, when you cut into it, if it does fire, we're probably all going to need new shorts because it's going to get our attention, right? But it's just going to release that air. It's not going to go into the bag where that bag can come down and hit us. With that being said, I'm not advocating going into the dashboard and poking holes and stuff so that it did fire. See where I'm going with that? What I'm saying is, is on the side curtain stuff that's coming out of here, if I cut above and I cut into that, if it was to fire, it wouldn't be that big a deal. How about those little cylinders? What do you think the pressures are in there? 4,000 to 14,000. Yeah. Actually, they're saying even lower, 2,500 PSI. Here's what I want you to think about on some of those cylinders that fire that stuff. A lot of pressure. <laughs> Talking with the guy over at General Motors, we were over there that, you've seen Ron Moore, the Volt video? that they did that was online. They had the classes you could go to down in Detroit and different places. I was there the day they shot that video. And so I had a chance to talk to the people who helped design the car. And uh, one of the guy who designed the safety components of the car is actually the deputy chief over in Fenton Township over in the Flint area. And so I like talking with Ed because he's a firefighter. He gets what we do, right? And I asked him, you know, what are, the, what are they? Can you tell me exactly what it is? He says, I can't. He says, they're all over the spectrum. He says, here's something I teach my guys, and I think it's worthy of sharing. An SCBA bottle, a 2216, holds 2,200 pounds of air, right? A 4,500 bottle, okay? If airbags are anywhere in between there, and you gave a number of 4,000 up to 14,000, would you ever think about taking a hydraulic cutter to an SCBA cylinder or an oxygen cylinder? No. I think common sense probably has saved most of us. We agree on that. And, and what I'm getting at is, is, then why would you cut into that? It's something under pressure. I think all of our training has been, hey, we try to avoid those type of things, right? Mm -hmm. So just be aware that, you know, that's something to share as you're going out and talking with the crews and stuff, is that it is, even within, and I'm talking about in the General Motors line, it's all over the spectrum. Mm -hmm. okay. But something is going to fire that thing. Now, a lot of them today, it's a once and boom, and it's done. They're working on some stuff with some smart technology with the idea that it will fire up two, three times. Okay. Also, don't be surprised that there's a more than just airbags coming out of the dash, coming out of the side. 
Uh, there's knee bags that are coming out underneath the dash. There's some that are coming out underneath the seats. You've got them coming out of the side of the seats. Okay. So there's a number of airbags coming in a lot of different places that we typically haven't seen them in the past. Cool. And I don't know about you, but you can give me the thing on that car and say memorize it. Well, if I mm -hmm. memorize a hundred of them, am I going to be able to pull that out late at night? I'm a firm believer in look for the IDs. There'll be a stamp in there where it'll say mm -hmm. airbags, or there'll be an iron-on transfer, or it'll be molded mm -hmm. into it, or supplemental mm -hmm. restraint system. Look for that. Stay clear of those areas. Even after I get the battery, I still don't want to mess around in those areas a whole bunch. Okay. But by getting that battery is from the auto industry, they're saying that's we're making it as safe as we can to work in it. What if we can't get the battery? We, we don't do nothing. Do something. Yeah, we got to we got we got to do something. And, and you know what? Out of the, all these cars have airbags in there, and I don't think any of you are scared to get in that car right now, knowing that it would thinking, hey, this thing's going to jump out and hit me, right? But the reality is, is when we start manipulating and moving stuff. There's also some things that you can do where we get into today is if you take the fender and you stay to the outside and take it from the hinge side and work your way back, you can never make entry into the passenger compartment. What I would caution you from the EMS side of it is if it hasn't fired, especially the front, that passenger airbag comes out a long ways. And I don't know, maybe we've got to get creative that I'm in the back seat trying to help you put that cat on as opposed to kneeling in that seat. Because you kneeling on that passenger seat sideways, putting somebody in a cat or providing care, and that thing fires, you're going to get hit. Which leads us to how far do airbags come out? The airbags that are coming out of the side of your seats and stuff, they come out about five inches. And most of the time they fill in a void of when it's being crushed in. Most of the time, they, we aren't going to come in contact with them. Okay? The passenger or the side curtain that come down, come down about 15 inches. Okay? So, and if we were leaning in here, even if I'm handing you stuff for an IV or something, that thing fires, it's going to come down and hit me. Probably not going to feel too good, right? The steering wheel comes out 10 inches and the passenger comes out 20 inches. How do I remember that? 5, 10, 15, 20. Okay, and it's just good solid numbers. Now you might read somebody's stuff and says, no, that airbag comes out 22 inches and that airbag comes out 6 inches. It's still pretty close to 5, 10, 15, 20. Are we good on that? Yep. And I don't want to put stuff in front of it either. You know, there was a thought for a while, well, what if we slid a backboard or something in there? I don't want something in between coming in contact, right? Also, there was a, a kind of a push out there for a while, too, of putting what they call a bag buster on the steering wheel. Yeah, but yeah. well, here's what they found out about that is it worked in testing if you installed it correctly. What happened in the in the heat of the moment that things twisted a little bit? You don't get it out all the way and it fires? Now you got some projectiles. Any questions? I can't get to the battery. Obviously, yep. we're going to be careful. I got to assume that even though there's fuses all over the place, it's really not going to defeat the airbag system at all. Well, not unless you, if you get, you in get the right one. I yeah. mean, if you rip every fuse out of the vehicle, you might get the right one. I mean, the last one that uh, we had up here, I couldn't get at the battery yeah. because it was uh, crushed down under the fender. So I just took air, all of the things out of all yep. the relays, mm -hmm. all the main bus fuses, everything. Hopefully I got the right one. Yeah. There again, try to limit your contact to areas where, you know, like I said, kneeling on seats or reaching in or mm -hmm. putting something between the steering wheel so that it did fire. But that being said, there has never been a firefighter injured by an airbag deployment of the vehicle that it had the tow on. Never has happened. So why do we want to get that? Because it greatly we don't want to be number one. Of statistically <laughs> not. Right? It's the people that have gotten in trouble is when they've left the battery in place. Everybody good? When, you, um, when you're done with these tools, when I say done, we decide we're going to take the spreader off or we're going to go to the ram. If you lay that down on the side of the road, what do you think potentially happens? We're going to get dirt inside of here, right? And let's face it, it's pretty nice to be able to hot swap tools and we can be pretty fast so we can go back and forth. And so, but there are some limitations here. Um, you want to make sure that you're covering that up. You want to get the cap on it. Or if you're going to wait for a minute, a lot of times I'll just stand here like this. Or I'll, if I go to set it down, I'll set it down and I'll tuck it in if, if the cap is gone or something. But I want to make sure that I try to keep that out. Now I had one up in Mount Pleasant two summers ago 
the ki- I couldn't say it fast enough. Don't set it down. It was like a cartoon, you know. It's like a slow motion. And I watched this thing go right into a sand pile. It looked like a Q-tip. It had like oh. sand everywhere. And I'm like, wow. What's the fix in the field? It's this. I took my Nomex hood. I wiped it off the best I could. I worked it in there the best I could. I wiped it on my bunker pant leg the best I could. And then I went and got a can of WD-40 that I have. And I held, held it up and I sprayed it up in there. And I got it, it came out. The other quick fix, some people do it. The next time the peanut butter jar is emptied here at the station, wash it out instead of recycling it. Put about that much hydraulic oil in it, put the cap on it, put it on the engine. If you get a bunch of dirt in here, the quick fix is this. Screw the top up, do this in the jar. Gravity takes over, stuff drops out, and you're good to go. Do you want hydraulic oil or mineral oil? Uh, the hydraulic oil. Okay. Yep, the regular hydraulic oil. Well, we have, we have hydraulic like, persons. Yeah, no, make sure we're using and then we have mineral oil. Right, make sure we're using the, that's another good point. You've got that old oil over there. Make sure we're using the Genesis oil, right? And it's comp- most of the 10.5 systems are all running the same mineral oil. But you start taking some of that 5,000 PSI, in fact, if that stuff's for the most part out of that stuff needs to be moved and locked up because I've had people mix fluids and then it may potentially cause some problems down the road. Okay? So that is an issue. We do not want to mix the, the fluids together. All right? But the idea here is getting rid of all that stuff. Are we good on that? Also, walking out the hose, I didn't show you this when we hooked it up. So I'm here. I'm not so much worried about that. It's protected. I'm going to get the cap on here. When you go to walk the hose up, Notice this swivels. Also, this is the portion when we go to put it on the tool. A lot of times, guys will be over here trying to do this. Okay, it's the swivel part. Also, if the cap's on here, flip the cap off. It doesn't work so good. Right? <laughs> Grab here. Walk this straight out. See how it's flipping? Okay. Now you've got all your kinks, all your and now come back and go to work. So it's a good idea to set it down, hook it up, walk it out. Kind of keep an eye on the pump. I've seen people about to drag the pump off the truck. <laughs> the idea is to get the kinks out, right? And then I'm gonna hook up my tools and I'm gonna to go to work. Also, you notice I got them laid out nicely. Okay. What if you have a knot? Like whoever coiled it, put a knot in it. Walk it out as much as you can, then come back through, feed this up through, pull it through, and go to work. Okay, that's, the, that's the nice thing about being in the hot spot. Cool. Where are we going next?